Do that. Yeah. All right. Welcome to my presentation, Getting Started with Kubernetes. I'm George Castro, and I brought a coworker with me named Ralph. He can raise his hand in the back. <laughs> Ralph is the engineer that you bring when you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that's me. Um, so who am I? I used to live around here, and I was kind of known as the Ubuntu guy in the area. I worked there for, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so, and then with the project way longer than that. Um, so I've been doing operating system stuff for a really long time. Awesome. And then life happened, and I moved to Ann Arbor, and now I'm a hippie, and now I do distributed systems, and I don't get up here as much as I should. But I know a lot of you, and it's really good to see a lot of old people. I met people that I've known a yeah, long thanks, time, Joanna, thanks, and man. a whole bunch of new faces. <laughs> and Ralph, I don't know if you want to say something real quick. He lives in East Lansing, but he's available. Wow. Well, yep, I'm in East Lansing, and have been in the Lansing area for a while. I have worked at various passes um, mm -hmm. previous to this, mostly in Ruby, and then doing some distributed system stuff there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And these days we both work at Heptio. Um, so if you know a little bit of the history of Kubernetes, which is outlined in the book, um, it was mostly invented by three people. So Craig McClucky, Joe Beta, which I found out is Beta, um, but he doesn't correct people, which is weird. And Brendan Burns, two of them um, left Google and started Heptio. And then the third one, Brendan Burns, um, runs the Azure Kubernetes product at Microsoft. Um, but they're all still involved in, in part of Kubernetes. So what Heptio does is it helps people who don't understand all the complicated things that I'm about to show you and help people be successful in, in cloud native technologies. So I have cards there if you're interested. I also have Kubernetes stickers, which are pretty awesome. So make sure you grab that great swag. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start by telling you that I started, so towards my tail end of Canonical, like my last year, I was dabbling in <coughs> Kubernetes. But then as part of Heptio, um, I've been kind of doing Kubernetes full time, but my job there is community manager. Not really like in knee deep doing Kubernetes engineering, because those of you who know me know that I know just about enough to get in trouble. Um, so as part of my job, I kind of do community work inside of Kubernetes upstream. So. If you've seen any Kubernetes video, there's a chance I probably re-recorded it. Um, I help run meetings, I help organize SIGs. We do a whole bunch of things that in the Kubernetes community we call uh, chop wood and carry water, right? So things that nobody wants to do, but you kind of have to do, right? There's like some enlightenment thing. Before enlightenment, you have to chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, you still have to chop wood and carry water. Um, so it's like one of the mantras from Kubernetes. So I'm learning a lot of things. So despite me spending about a year uh, learning this stuff the best I could while trying to have a new baby and a new job and everything, um, I was really concerned when Jim sent me the mail, you should come talk. He didn't even give me a choice. He was like, you're coming to talk about something. <laughs> uh, I was like, hey, I'm not ready. Like, I'm used to like knowing this stuff backwards and forwards or whatever. So uh, I told my boss, Joe, and I was like, hey, should I accept this? Should I make up an excuse? Like, you know, maybe it'll snow that day. And he was like, man, I wrote this stuff. I still have no idea what's going on in a lot of the areas. Because this thing is all encompassing. It's like a huge, complex system. So one thing I've learned about distributed systems is they're very complex. And eventually, they kind of become consistent. But in between here and there, like stuff could be happening. And you don't know. So if you thought you were going to come to this talk and think, by the end of this talk, I'm going to have everything I need to know to run Kubernetes just like an SRE at Google. Let me just set some expectations for you right away. Um, but what I do want to know, something that wasn't obvious to me until I actually read the book on a plane on the way to KubeCon, is there's a lot of concepts that, because of where Kubernetes is in the hype cycle, that people forget to tell everybody, right? They just start off with like, hey, I just met you. Kubernetes is going to solve all your problems, right? And then they go back and you're like, what kind of shop are you? Well, we don't even do containers, right? And then you've set someone up for failure, and that sucks. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on the concepts as I've learned them and um, kind of talk about the things and the mistakes that I made <coughs> so you can look at it holistically, right? Um, because the implementation details, some chapters in this book, you're like, 
that's going to be worthless in about you know six months, right? Whereas like the beginning of the book and concepts are when you when you speak to someone who had worked on board maybe back in the day or something, they kind of tell you how they got to those conclusions, right? And that's something you can take with you anywhere, right? Regardless of the implementation as you see it in Kubernetes or in Mesos or in whatever other distributed system you're into. So show of hands, how many of you have heard of Kubernetes at all? Probably everybody. Okay. How many of you are using it in production today? Yeah, see, I knew. Someone owes me a beer. There's always only one. Um, how many of you are playing with it? You have it in a lab, or you've tried it on cloud. What do you think? You could just yell out. So far, so good. So far, so good? Not so good. Not so good? Ralph? Oh, you probably hate, hate yours. Anybody else? Anyone do what I did and just like app get install, and then you couldn't find it? So you went and you grabbed instructions and you installed it? And then you didn't read a single damn thing, and then you have no idea what you did to your computer? <laughs> no one did that? Okay. <laughs> Liars. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so it all starts with cloud native. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you a quick, you, you all know what the hype curve is. You guys seen this where like someone, everybody loves something, and then they try it, and then they and hate it, and then the bottom, yeah. right? Like we're, we're down here with Docker right now where everyone's like, some Ruby kid told me this was the greatest thing ever, and now I hate my life. Right? And then, so Kubernetes right now, as it stands, is at the absolute peak of the hype curve, right? Everywhere you go in computing, someone's going to tell you what a problem is. They're going to, the solution is going to be Kubernetes. It doesn't matter. My car doesn't start. That's because Kubernetes isn't running on it. And you're like, what? Like, that's not even related. So if you notice, like, if you go online and, um, you know, you read comments in Hacker News or whatever, someone's always like, oh, yeah, but then I tried Docker and blah, 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 blah. Right? Now we're at the point of the curve where it's like, hey, hey, hold on a minute. Two years ago, you were all saying Docker, Docker, Docker. And then I went into, into it with a different set of expectations. Now I have a whole different set of problems that everyone always glosses over the problems, right? Um, so I'm going to start with what cloud native is because it all kind of started with containers. And then no one, like, it can't just be cloud because that's taken. And that's already a loaded term, in my opinion, as it is. So now there's this term called cloud native. Uh, there's an organization called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's basically the sister organization to Linux Foundation. So if you go there, and Kubernetes is part of this organization, along with other uh, projects. Um, so if you look, and I was like, I'm going to find out what the definition of cloud native is, right? And they just kind of give you three very vague things, right? Something needs to be containerized. Okay, I get that. It gets put in a container. Dynamically orchestrated. Can someone in English tell me what that means? <laughs> Scripted. Sort of. So you have some kind of a system that basically provisions the, the VF, or provisions the containers, yes. schedules them, makes sure they're running, and then can, sure. can expand or contract yeah. as the man needs. So the dynamic part there is IP addresses and DNS, right? Like throw out the idea that this thing is going to always have this IP address. Um, so yeah. And then microservices oriented. This is another thing that's currently in the hype cycle where they're telling you that app you were working on for 25 years, throw it away and rewrite it all into 7,500 smaller apps that each have an API guarantee. Because everyone read that like post from the guy who used to work at Amazon that Jeff Bezos figured it out like 20 years ago and that's why the modern world works today, right? So like, um, there are pluses and minuses to doing a microservice thing. That's a whole nother talk. I'm not here to sell you or discourage you from using microservices. <laughs> but the idea there is that instead of big monolithic apps, it's a bunch of things that are broken down and there are a bunch of smaller apps with API guarantees to each other so that they can each individual, each team can rev on those things and deliver features without having one big monster thing, right? Currently in the hype, hype cycle, um, People talk about, see, I'm even doing it right now, the big monster thing. It's slow and crappy, right? Um, but now I think people are starting to realize that doing microservices also brings a lot of complexity, right? And some organizations aren't, aren't ready for that. So there's that. That was my spiel on microservices. Um, so I asked my boss. I was like, hey, dude, you like invented this. What do you think it is? <laughs> so we have a blog post on here. Um, in hindsight, that huge long URL was not a good idea, so just Google for Heptio Cloud Native, uh, and that should come up number one. Um, 
So for him, it was interesting, as I was talking to him right, bef right before I was coming here, he was like, everyone thinks cloud native is like, you have to do these things, right? You have to have everything in containers. Containers are definitely part of it, things like that. But everyone always forgets the teams, the culture, the technology, and things like that. That, that will become important uh, later on because Kubernetes makes certain assumptions about how you want to run your infrastructure, and if you're not set up for that organizationally, you will fail spectacularly. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so first, is anybody here a container? Who's using? Okay, so I asked who's using Kubernetes like in production. Anyone using containers regularly, like at all? Docker. Docker, yeah. LXC. LXC. Anybody else? All right. So I'm going to try to get to the container part quickly, but I also have an extra half hour. So it's important that you understand this. So if at any time I'm going too fast, or if you think this is too easy, tell me either way or the other. Just like Kenny can throw things at me. One way or the other. If you hit me, then I know I'm going too fast. Um, all right, so the basic thing is a container. There are two kind of containers. People, people tend to conflate the word container to automatically mean Docker. That is not true. So the first thing you're going to take home today is Containers, all Docker containers are containers. Not all containers are Docker containers. Mm -hmm. Everyone understand that? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I think Stefan has actually spoken here before. He has. Right. Trying to get him. Yeah. Right. Okay. Two kind, probably more, I don't know, depends on who you ask. But the two major kinds of containers are system containers and application containers. This is a system container. Um, when I do Lex, LexD launch Ubuntu colon, did I get that right? Enter. Whatever the command yeah. is, or whatever. And then version number. It grabs a version, it, it, it grabs an Ubuntu image, and then I have an Ubuntu operating system on my computer. Right? I can SSH into these directly. They have an init system in there. It's like a full OS. It's like a virtual machine, um, except I don't have to wait for the slow virtual box part. Right? So these are awesome. People like these because they can take stuff that used to be in VMs and stick it into containers and automatically not worry about the hypervisor overhead, right? You get like the speed, it's like you just got a 20% hardware for free, right? What technology do you know that just gives you 20 extra percent, right? So that's pretty awesome, except for certain use cases, right? So like VMs still have, there's a certain um, hardware features and CPUs that make isolation in real VMs better, uh, but for most cases, this is just pretty much a win for anyone that's that's using VMs for, for their use case. We're not talking about these today. Um, so this is just a full full OS. I encourage you to play with it. It's good stuff. I used to play with this a lot. Unfortunately, not as much these days. Because I've learned what immutable systems are, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the biggest property I want you to think of in, in the context of, of application containers and Kubernetes is that system containers are mutable, VMs are mutable. So what I mean by mutable means that they, I can change them, right? I can SSH into them, I can app get install MySQL, and now that bare image of Ubuntu now has a database installed. Do I have everyone still? All right, awesome. So growing up when I was a system administrator, this was my jam. Being able to take something and change it to exactly what I wanted was like the best thing ever, right? So I would start with a bare image, and then way back in the day, I discovered Puppet at Oakland University. Kanye was there. I was like, this is awesome. This takes an existing bare install and then puts all the exact bits that I need on it, right? And then I have that. And now, instead of managing um, a whole bunch of servers that they had cool names, right? Remember, like, Salida? I can't even spell that. I don't know how I was thinking. Um, so instead of having these like pets, you just had a generated thing. Okay, this machine that I just racked is going to be a web server, right? It installs the OS. You have an automated kickstart thing. Puppet runs or Chef Apply or whatever it is you're into these days. And then it turns it into a web service or a web server and then everything's awesome. Um, so I, I really enjoyed having mutable, mutable uh, operating systems and systems in general. That's why when I heard about immutable systems, which I'll get to in a minute, my whole world turned upside down. Um, and I feel that a lot of people, when they get started, they don't, they don't know that. So that's why usually people start with Kubernetes. They're like, OK, I want to take my existing virtual machines and plop them into this new thing. I'm like, what are you doing? 
Um, so I, I want to make sure that everyone understands the difference between mutable and immutable. So I've done mutable. Ready for immutable? Okay. So this is an application container. Ideally, it contains your application, its dependencies, and nothing else. A lot of times, it contains a lot more stuff than you want, but that's okay. So the way both system containers and app containers work is you have the host, which is your server, that you get from Amazon or whatever, then it's running a kernel, and then these containers run on top of that, right? And they share the kernel with the host, right? That's why they're so efficient compared to a VM. It has a kernel inside each VM, right? That's why it's slower. Okay, so an application container, the reason, the reason people really like this and it solves one problem that everybody has just hated their entire life in operations and stuff. It makes sure that the code that you write on your laptop, you give it to me in a container, and it will run wherever I put it the exact same way as you gave it to me. That is the one thing I want you to remember, the one thing Docker solves, because people overcomplicate it, right? Docker is like a really fancy tarball, right, or a binary. That you I give you a blob and it runs the exact same way. In the old days, when systems were mutable, right, what would happen? James would write his little application. Sweet, here you go, it's ready to go. Go being served, here you go, George. It doesn't work, why? Oh, you installed the wrong version of PHP on the server. These are all the dependencies, blah, blah, blah. Now James just gives me a big blob and I throw it somewhere and it works, it always works. So one thing Docker solves, because a lot of people think, well, that sounds relatively simple, but if you think about it, if you think about every single time you've had to move something from a person who's written it or a team who's written it, either between other teams or to somebody else, if you think about all the pain that you've ever gone through, right, it solves this one problem, um, which is really great. George? <clears throat> yes? And I, I can defer this if it's better, but like, sure. um, I don't know Docker as well, but I, I do know GAE. Pretty well. Okay. So is it is it kind of like that in the sense that if, if you follow the model, it's easy to scale, or is that still up to the developer to do? So, can we defer that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> awesome. I know. I think I know what you're saying, but I think I know the exact part where that makes that question okay. makes more sense. Um, so applications are not like virtual machines at all. Um, although sometimes. Also, one thing to remember is these tools are available for anybody, including for anybody to misuse them, right? So I've heard people <laughs> saying, oh, I go into my Docker containers and then I change a bunch of stuff, and now I have a beautiful and unique Docker container that I can't reproduce. Why would you do that? Don't do that. So you can shove these tools to do whatever you want, but that's why I'm always cognizant of think about why the tool was designed to do that, and think of those patterns, and think of what's an anti-pattern. So at first, I was like, you cannot modify them easily. That's ridiculous. So my friend, I don't want to embarrass him, his name is Jim Ferris. He calls me. <laughs> he goes, hey, see, here's, here's, in the first sentence, I knew he was in trouble. Hey, they told us at work we have to use Docker. I was like, OK. Uh, all right, so he's like, I have a problem, though. I go into the container. And then I need to turn on debugging on the web server. It's very simple, right? I need to turn so I can figure out how my application is busted. And then I go in there, and then I change it, and then I restart the container, and all my changes went away. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the first time you ran Docker, right, this happened. You're like, oh, this is awesome. I can get the latest stuff. There's all this crack rack out there. It's just awesome, right? And you restart it. Where's your data? Gone, right? And you're like, I don't understand why this is like the greatest thing ever. Everyone's, everyone's doing it. So for him, his initial idea was this thing is broken, so I'm going to go to the thing and fix it, right? That, that makes, think about it, that makes sense, right? What people don't tell you, like when you first started off at Docker, is you need to treat Docker like an output, right? Almost like a PDF. There's a reason you give, if you're giving people a newsletter, you give them a PDF. You don't give them each a Word document so they can mess with it, right? So on your, you don't, your laptop doesn't have that font installed, right? So it looks different, right? Your version of Word is, you know, two versions older. One person in LibreOffice can't even open the document, right? So, all right, that was kind of mean. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? But if you give someone a PDF, they, they can only print that, right? And 
But in a PDF, there's forms, so people can put in you know, what they need exactly for that. So think about Docker like that. You get a blob from somebody, but you can take different environment variables and pass that along to the Docker to get different things, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit. So immediately I told him, I was like, hey, you're like trying to edit a, a printed piece of paper, right? Um, what needs to happen is Docker containers are made from a thing called a Docker file. If you take a Docker file and you put it, assuming you have Docker installed on that system, you can all build the same container. It's like a recipe, right? Then he told me, well, I'm not allowed to mess with the Docker file. And I was like, this is why you figure out whether you need a tool first, right? <laughs> um, so eventually he got it sorted out because immediately he was like, this is terrible for development. I can't change anything. Um, but from the ops perspective, I'm like, damn right. Not change anything, developers. Not, not in my environment, right? Um, so they're really, really great for bundling um, applications and its dependencies. And then, oh, I actually left my notes here before. So we're basically treating these applications like cattle instead of pets. People heard this is a pretty popular term now, right? So you're no longer tied to like a, a we used to call them snowflake servers, right? George is the only person that can set this thing up. And if you fire George, you got to re-image the thing, right? Now we're heading to a place where it's the hosts themselves are immutable and the OS is very slimmed down, something like container Linux, let's say, or rel atomic or something like that, right? And it's it's just basically a baseline thing and wiping that is 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 normal. And then eventually Kubernetes plops workloads on it. And if there's an application update or if there's an OS update it needs to reboot, it does because it talks to the scheduler and we'll get to all that fancy stuff in a minute. Um, these days it's probably Docker. Um, there are different runtimes that you can use in Kubernetes, but I don't want you to worry about, about that right now. So just assume Docker for now, even though technically there are, there are other things available. Everyone good with application containers. So one thing I've noticed, especially for, um, for smaller <coughs> app applications for things, like I don't need Kubernetes at my house, right? But like I like to have a Plex Media Server, right? Um, so I've moved a lot of those workloads onto Docker. Right? Like, I've kind of learned being in this area that I put everything in a Docker container and then all the volume mounts, which is homework if, if, you, if you need to figure that is, what that is, is the state of that stuff. Now I have one thing to back up, right? So I put all my state for all my applications, right? One place on the file system and then I just back up the whole thing to S3 so that if that host goes away and sell an OS on a new machine, I do one git pull, and then I just rerun the Docker containers, and then everything is magical because the state is moving with them. So I'm even finding that this, even if you don't need Kubernetes, it's really nice when someone says, hey, have you tried this new funky database or whatever, right? I can fire it up in a Docker container. When I'm done with it, I throw it away. I don't have a broken, oh no, I have to apt auto clean, and then you know, I told myself I was gonna leave the server alone, and things like that. So now these days I put everything in a Docker container. Period. Um, so it's really simple. This is what a Docker file looks like. You would say from, and then people publish uh, images to what's called a registry. So in this case, uh, by default, in this case, it would grab a Bluetooth from the Docker Hub uh, version 1604, right? You might be tempted to put colon latest, which will always grab the latest thing, but then you'll learn that pending versions is the smarter way to do it. And then who you are and then what you want to happen inside that Ubuntu base image, right? So in this case, I'm going to install Redis, and then I'm going to expose it in its default port, and then the entry point is like the binary that I want to use. Um, so I'll write that. I'll call it Docker file with a capital D. You might see this now when you go on GitHub. You see projects have a Docker file in their root directory. That's so you can do a Docker pull, read the Docker file itself, you know, make sure it's legit, um, and then build it. So now on my system, I have a container named Redis-George, uh, and then I can run it, right? So now my application is, is in there. So what people do is they'll take a base image, and then see the app get update, app get install? Whatever crazy stuff you're doing at work to make your application work, you would put that in there, right? And then everyone can do a Docker pull, and then you build that into a container. And now you have a nice contained portable thing. Now, uh, 
There are opinions on how best to do this. Like, for example, you will see instead of from one thing people figured out, I don't need the whole entire operating system, you know, despite all the work Bozer did making the Ubuntu Cloud image really small, right? You can also do like from PHP and just get like the PHP libraries, right? And you just have the application stack, right? You don't need the rest of the OS. Um, there's a popular one called Alpine, which people use a lot in their Docker containers because it's really small. Uh, as you'll learn later, you want to keep your Docker containers really small because you're going to be copying this guy around a lot. Um, again, this can be a whole talk on how to build Docker files and best practices and things like that. But I just wanted to make you aware because once you discover Docker, you go into Docker Hub, which is where they list stuff, and you find all the goodies, and you're like, oh, someone put together an Elasticsearch stack for me? I don't even have to do any of this stuff. And you're like, Docker run, woo, let it rip, right? Um, but just like many things, there's also nothing to guarantee that the person who put that Docker container up there knew exactly what they were doing or that they're even doing the right thing. So for example, remember Heartbleed came out? That was the open SSL mm -hmm. thing, right? There's nobody guaranteeing that all those Docker containers up there are doing even doing an app get update and app get upgrade, right? Because usually the distros will publish like a new image every two, three weeks, or whatever, right? So unless you, so what should happen is, oh no, Heartbleed happened, everything in that registry should have been rebuilt, right? Eventually. But since they're all kind of derived from distros, which ones got patched, blah, 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 you don't know. So part of this, especially as we get onto Kubernetes, is if you think that you're just, especially at work in production, if you think that you're just going to grab all this neat stuff from the internet, because they're basically binaries, and then just running them in your own system, no. What you will do, though, is you can take these Docker files, right? Kind of have your experts check them out. And then you would set up your own registry internally that you would manage, right? Or for example, if you pay for RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they have, for customers, they have their own registry that has their own curated distro-like stuff so that when you get MySQL, you know you're getting a trusted <coughs> MySQL, for example. Um, and there's other registries, like uh, there's one called KQUAY, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, it was made by the CoreOS folks. Um, but it had a neat feature that would actually scan all the Docker containers in the registry and give you a flag if one of the libraries was, was out of date and stuff like that. Yeah. So the example you have here, are you building a Docker container that contains all of Ubuntu? Or are so, you building it with just Redis server? So all of Ubuntu. However, I happen to know that the Ubuntu image in the Docker Hub is very small. Okay. That's not an 800 meg. ISO, like you would install, like if you go to ubuntu.com, right? So I think they got, so it was 89 megs, I think, when I left, and everyone was complaining that was too big. 89 megs is too big. And then they reached for 1804, they got it down to 30 ish something. Wow. Um, because they stripped a bunch of stuff. But Alpine is like six megs, right? That's why people really like Alpine. Um, but then you don't get a real glibc, and then, anyway. You should get someone to talk about all of this because that's that's like, uh, kind of important. Scott uh, no, actually, Docker has people in Detroit. Okay. Yes, and as long as you don't mention anything that competes with Docker, they'd be more than happy to come. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with Docker. Yeah, yeah, like I do with all things. So that's really great, right? And then people started saying, "Hey, it would be really neat if you could bundle all this kind of stuff together as like little stacks of things." So this, Docker Compose is one of my favorite tools, especially for like small projects, right? Um, so when there's a tool that you can get called Docker Compose, which uses Docker. What you're doing here is we're defining some services, right? The first one's called MariaDB. It uses this image, so Bitnami's MariaDB database. Colon latest, I don't like that, but that's fine. Um, volumes, it's going to make a volume called MariaDB data and put it in slash bitnami because that's where they do it internally in their container. Mm -hmm. Set a user in a database. I did trim some stuff from here uh, to make it fit on the slide, but what I wanted to say is, look, you've got a database, and then you got WordPress. We're defining what ports to serve on. Like you can, it almost kind of explains itself, right? Yep. There's the database, and there's WordPress. It's opening these ports. 
It's on 443. Volumes, probably something to do with data, right? And then your passing environment variables, those, those are those forms in the PDF, right? So me, I can modify all of this stuff, right? But I'm still getting the images, Bitnami WordPress, the latest one, and MariaDB, the latest one, right? This is nice because that form makes me keep my username and password outside of the container. Very important thing I want you to remember when you go watch those videos after this, you're not baking any kind of secrets into your container. That's like bad, right? <laughs> what we want to do though is have a bunch of environment variables that we can pass <coughs> into the container so that we can have it do exactly what we want, right? And then the last bit, you're like, I don't understand. Why is, why is it 80 colon 80? Why are there two? Why are there two things? And when you play around with Docker, you'll find when you do a volume, you'll do a path somewhere, colon, then a path somewhere else. For a while, because I was just copying and pasting because I was cargo culting, I had no idea what that really means. It's pretty simple if you remember it this way. There's what's on your computer, right? That's going to be your local path. And it's like that for ports. And there's what the Docker container sees, right? So inside the Docker container, uh, the volume Maria DB data is in slash bitnam, right? This is important because what you'll do is on your local system, you'll give it a bunch of volumes, and then you'll have those mapped, and they'll be mapped inside the container, right? So I like doing this because sometimes I'll put configuration files on this volume, so I can change them and make them mutable, but the container itself is still immutable. So when I mess up, I just revert that, I do a git revert here, and I repull the container. Anyone having a hard time understanding this? Yeah. So that's how you get your like your certificates for your uh, HTTPS and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. So I don't. Is is that true? Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I totally skipped Docker. Click them on a volume and have it configured where to pull it from. And, yeah. Awesome. Good to know. So this is great for home use, right? Usually I'm like, okay, I, I like on Reddit, I, I follow self host the self hosted subreddit where it's like. <clears throat> It gives you open source software that you can run on your own, you know, whatever, so you don't have to depend on a SaaS. And people will trade these with each other. You just put this in a directory and you'll type Docker Compose up, and it's magical. It'll just grab all this stuff and things will work. And it'll be all wonderful um, <clears throat> until you restart it and you realize that I should have learned the workflow before depending on this thing. But that's more of a George thing. All right, so you have Docker. Docker Compose is pretty neat. There's a third one you can upgrade from this is called Docker Swarm, which is similar to Kubernetes as it's an orchestration thing. Again, a topic that deserves its own talk. Um, and Docker has recently announced that they'll natively be able to run Kubernetes, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, some quick stats to show you about this whole immutable disposable thing. So Datadog, they, do, they have a monitoring product. It's kind of cool. You run an agent on your machine. It gives you graphs and stuff. Um, so they actually measure all their customers' um, infrastructure. And a container that's orchestrated with a system like Kubernetes has a median of 2.5 days before it's killed. A normal container that is just a box with a Docker container running on it, five and a half days, and 23 days for a VM. So when we were talking about dynamic before, in that definition of what cloud native is, stuff is getting killed all the time, right? And it was weird for me to move into that world to know that that's normal, right? Like, why is stuff being killed? If stuff's being killed, I'm out of memory or something like that. So something to think about in these distributed systems, especially when we talk about moving things, moving things from host to host. Remember the first time you saw VMware vMotion, right? It took a snapshot of the VM and really quickly moved it over to another computer and then started it right away, right? And I thought that was the coolest thing. That's still, that's still incredible to me, right? The Kubernetes way is different. You kill this and you start another one here, right? You literally just kill it and start it here. Because the containers are immutable, it's fine. You're getting the exact same thing here and there. Okay. I'm going to go on the immutable thing a lot, but that's like the one, like if you go home and you're like the one thing I know, um, and this is all fine, this is good, except now you have tons of containers, I have an hour left, right? Okay. 
Uh, now you had tons of containers everywhere, right? And when I first started, I had tons of stuff running and I didn't really know how to use the tool. And if you don't clean up your old containers, they fill, fill up the root of your disk. Who's done that? Mm -hmm. like the first time they discovered Docker. Um, and they didn't have a command to clean up. You had to pipe it into, uh, anyway, I don't know. Love-hate relationship. Uh, but now you can type, what is it, Docker system prune or something like that? It's pretty nice. Um, so this is all fine. It's, again, who's checking that the images you're building are, aren't affected by a CVE, right? Um, like what if instead of Ubuntu, I'm using some guy's custom image who I've never met in my life, right? Um, yeah, one of my favorite things, because people who, especially crotchety sysadmins, of which I'm a proud member, right? They're like, Docker's stupid. Are you telling me you just grabbed a... The last thing I want is my developers like giving me a container and they don't know what they're doing, right? Um, but just want to reiterate that we, when we say that Docker file or whatever, right? When, you, when you're publishing and giving me my app, you're not giving me the app. You're actually giving me your Docker file, right? You're going to do a git push or something that does something fancy and that Docker file goes somewhere. Something somewhere is going to trigger and a machine that we trust is going to build a container and then it's going to put it into our pipeline and we'll do that later. So there's this, when people criticize containers in this workflow, they kind of think that people are just ad hoc throwing random, bi random binaries into production. So we're talking about this as a piece of the pipeline. But for development, it's great, right? Developers just sit there, they rev it, spit it out, and then they can reasonably be certain that when I build a container, I will get the exact same experience as that. Hey, George. Yeah. If you switch, when you've seen people switch to like, like a more using containers as mm -hmm. opposed to VMs, um, is there like a testing change where they like follow something like Netflix and do like a chaos monkey, or are they just doing that in, the, in their CI pipeline? How, how are they basically testing that 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 immutable the, 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 the immutable property actually works, and that if you just throw stuff away, you're not going to lose things? Yeah. Do you want to answer this first, or do you want me to? So. The big one is how you're treating your data. Um, so if there's a 12-factor manifesto, um, Roku kind of started it. And basically, when you're testing your app, you speak want, up a bit. When you're testing your app, you want to make sure that you're sending the state of your application to places that are meant to contain it instead of locally on the internet. But so as far as your, testing changes and stuff, it turns into part of your CI pipeline. Uh, in theory, you even want this part of the application CI pipeline. If you make a change to the application, the way it tests is actually it builds a container and runs the test against it or whatnot, so that what you're actually testing is will this work and pass all the tests and the, the things we have in CI before it lands and turns into an image that gets run out. Um, and then the flip side of that is it's not so much chaos monkey, but then the uh, I'm sure George can show you. I can get a gradual. Um, uh, what's the dead bird? Um, canary. canary. The canary rollouts, <laughs> so that you can. And you're actually measuring your percentage of failures, and making sure that as you run your canary rollouts to your 40, you know, containers that are running your stuff in production, that as you roll them out, that your error percentages aren't going up in any significant fashion as the canaries go out. And if they are, then you stop, revert back very easily because you have not <coughs> containers built for the last version and debug what the heck just caused this rollout to you know, increase your error rate and stuff. I do want to add, before we get to that, I have an app section here later on, but I do want to add is some applications do not like being run in containers. Right? Like the database, remember the database went away and then it flips out. It's like that again. Right? Like where people had to learn, you know, oh, there needs to be a timeout, you know, that sort of thing. So, uh, using Jim as an example again, he goes, oh, I have a problem. When we make a config change to our application, we have to restart it, right? And in this dynamic environment, he's like, that means, you know, if we make a change, we have to restart the container, right? And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's fine though, right? Because actually what's happening is you have a load balancer in a group you have a replica set, right? When you make that change, it'll upgrade all these first, pass test, then the DNS will kick over, and we'll get to this in a minute, right? But like he was like, oh, 
again, he was in the mindset. He was like, but we don't want to have to do all that. All we need to do is change a config thing, right? And it was like, aha. It's because we're kind of trained to think that bouncing a service or that bouncing a service is like an expensive operation, right? But if you make it just easy and quick, it's fine. Now, more modern apps, right, will take a dynamic configuration and then just change their state without needing to do any of that, right? So there's this whole, there's another thing you need a whole presentation on, it's called 12-factor apps, where application developers are taking those things into account. Um, but that is one of the challenges that organizations have. They have these applications that are kind of not written for that world, right? So if, like, I'm sure you've all met someone that, like, the IP address changed. Why does your app care, right? It does, right? And you're like, how do we get here? Um, that one surprisingly comes up a lot. I'm kind of embarrassed about that. Um, and then who is vetting all these containers, right? So as we'll, we'll see later, these containers are getting constantly killed and copied around, even on your internal LAN. And it's very, very easy for you to make really fat containers, right? Uh, and people hate these because not everything is slow. And again, that's a thing where there's a ton of tooling here that can help here. Each one of these like things that I point out, there's, there's a bunch of tooling built around it that I don't really have time to go into here. Um, so I just want everyone to remember that you still need to do operations, complexity is shifted, right? That open SSL bug or whatever is still your problem, whether you have a container or it's on bare metal, right? I think, um, you know, people also do this with serverless as well, right? It's like, oh, I don't have to worry about anything. It's like, no, somebody has to take care of that server, just not you. That's just a <laughs> service quality. You're just shifting who's responsible for what. Someone's got to take care of that. Anyway. That's a, that's a whole different thing. Um, so today, now after that half hour intro, now we can talk about Kubernetes. Um, so today you're basically learning Linux. The equivalent of Linux. You're not learning MySQL or, or anything like that. So you're not gonna come to the end of this and figure out how to serve a web, serve a web page. Um, uh, Kubernetes has been likened to Linux uh, a lot, and we'll go into that. But the other stuff is still important. Getting your applications and all that stuff and getting your net. I'm not even going to touch networking today at all. We could literally have two days worth of networking talks on each one of the different networking stacks that plugs into Kubernetes. Um, but all that stuff is absolutely important. Um, like I said, I want to concentrate on, on um, concepts. So there's a few ways to get started. Uh, the first is Minikube. This is basically like a vagrant-like experience that you type, Minikube start, and then on your computer you have a little VM that's running like a little mini version of Kubernetes, and then you can deploy apps to that. <clears throat> if you're running Docker on OS X or Windows, you have an awesome experience where it's just built in to like the little GUI, and you can say start in Kubernetes mode. Although I think for Windows you have to be on the Edge channel or something like that. But um, Docker now, instead of just running native Docker containers and Docker Compose, can now actually do um, native Kubernetes stuff. So that's pretty neat. That would be a great like, lightning talk if one of you guys figures that out. I'm not a Mac person. Uh, kubeadmin is the installer, quote unquote installer, from uh, Kubernetes upstream. So what it does is you take a machine or VM, you type kubeadmin, and then it makes a Kubernetes master node out of it. And then on the other nodes, you say kubeadmin join, and then a token, and it all joins, and it creates a cluster for you in bare metal. It's pretty nice. As one flaw that will be fixed uh, this cycle is it doesn't create multi-master control planes. So for production, we're still saying not quite ready, but if you are crazy and you do have a lab or something at work or a little stack of Intel nuts or something like that, and you want to do bare metal, kubeadmin is the way to go there. Um, and then all of the clouds, have a Kubernetes product, including Amazon's, which is really hard to get into right now. You have to apply. Um, so that hasn't really gone GA yet. There's also a bunch of other tools that I haven't put on here. Uh, Cops was popular on Amazon. Um, Rick does Juju Conjure Up. Um, there's a few on there. I, if I had a nickel for every Ansible playbook that I found that installs Kubernetes, I'd be rich. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, but if you're looking for an easy experience, the hosted ones obviously are really, really good. 
uh, Docker Mini Cube are nice, and then Cube Admin for those of you who like to dig in and build a load balancer by hand because you're that person. I got something else real quick. Sure. Um, Catacoda at one of the other meetups I went last week uh -huh. was uh, it's like basically doing Kubernetes in your in your browser. It'll just just let you run it. And, ooh, yeah. I have seen this before. Through. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's that is awesome. All right, now I lost my place. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's not your fault. Right at the animated GIF, too. Like, well, I told myself I would only have one. <laughs> it's an awesome one, though. I know. I love it. Terminator Eric's awesome show. Right? Oh, of course, now it pauses. It was mm -hmm. awesome. So people are like, hey, I've seen, I've seen this. I've seen this play before, George, when you talked about OpenStack and all that kind of good stuff. Um, again, the whole OpenStack story, there's going to be like books about that someday. Um, but the major, major thing that Kubernetes was able to achieve is support from every public cloud. Right? OpenStack was kind of like, ah, forget Amazon, run your own, right? And that sounds great. Then you realize nobody wants, nobody wants to do that, man. I just want to like deploy applications. Um, so Kubernetes was able to achieve something that I think is very unique. Every cloud, Amazon was last, every cloud now offers mm -hmm. Kubernetes as a service, which is really great for you because that means if your application speaks Kubernetes, you can move stuff between different clouds. If you have bare metal, you can put stuff there. Um, <coughs> and we'll get to why that's awesome later on. So, uh, Kubernetes, Greek for Helmsman. Here's something. Not a lot of people know. The logo has seven sides to it. Does anyone know why? Who is it, Ralph? Okay, so this originally sprung out of decades of experience from inside Google. Like people love to hear that for some reason. Um, and Google had an internal tool called Borg and Omega and let me container that for you. <coughs> so they've been using containers for like a really, really long time. <coughs> and these are the folks that way before Docker came along, made sure that C groups worked in the kernel and did all that good stuff. So, um, so Kubernetes is heavily inspired by those. Actually, if you, you can actually search, probably on Google, for Borg Omega, and they have the actual papers published. So you can like read you know, all that. If you're really into distributed systems, knock yourself out on that. So um, Kubernetes, the symbol has seven sides, because seven of nine is the coolest Borg. She was the one in, in Star Trek Voyager. Not a lot of people know that. Also, it upsets Googlers, because all of their products have six or eight I don't know, sides on like Google Cloud. So the Kubernetes sticker always like doesn't match on their laptop. I like to point that out to them. <laughs> uh, so, so initially for the first year or so, like it was kind of known as Kubernetes by, you might see the low Kubernetes by Google and things like that. Uh, but what happened over the past few years is the CNCF was created and Kubernetes was donated to that. And now Kubernetes is a standalone project. We work with Googlers all, all the time, but it's community run, right? So. No Googlers like my boss or anything like that. Um, which is really great because it gives people a multi-vendor place, place to work. So that was really awesome. Um, Kubernetes automates deployment, scaling, and management of application containers. That's exa almost exactly what you said a little, a little while ago. <laughs> um, and it's one of the largest OSS projects in the world. If you ever go on GitHub, like you'll see all the projects. And Kubernetes, by far, is the activity is insane, right? Like. We have like over 900 open pull requests at any time. It's like this crazy, it's crazy. We're like breaking GitHub all the time. Um, but what does it actually do though, right? This is all the marketing stuff from the web, web page. Um, so it abstracts the underlying hardware. So this is something Joe wanted to make sure that you understood is the reason Unix, not just Linux, Unix was successful is because of the concepts if you learned the, the generic Unix concepts, you could use any Unix, right? Everything is a file. Once you learn everything is a file, everything kind of falls into place, right? Now I understand how pipes work, right? I could take the output of one command and pipe it into another, right? All I need to do is look at the man pages for the switches he used, but generally speaking, if I want to pipe something into that, it's the left hand side, right? Hmm. I don't know. I don't remember. So I'm very bad, but no. you get the idea. Well, no, it's 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 less. Oh, pipes. Yeah. The um, yeah. 
subtract and output into the file is a greater than. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, greater than, greater than is a pen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting old, What's Castro. The community will discuss this at our next meeting. <laughs> What's that? Yes, yeah. the sadden community will we'll discuss that. Yes, to get yes. basic bash one on one, talk to Rick. You know, I used to know that. I used to know how to use S trace and stuff too. Um, so, if you understood those concepts, right, you could sit down in a Unix box and kind of generally understand. Oh, Solaris, the backspace feed didn't work, right? But you could like figure that out, <laughs> right? What Kubernetes is trying to do. So that is a great model, right? There's a reason Unix won, right? Like, we all knew it, right? Um, but the thing is, is that everything being a file doesn't really work across other com other computers, right? Once you have a pile of computers, don't say NFS. Once you have a pile of computers, it all kind of falls apart, right? What Kubernetes is trying to do is basically def be like a POSIX slash Unix for a pile of computers, right? And when you think of it, it that way, it kind of helps, right? Computers have CPU, storage, and network. The first things you set up Right, are going to be your nodes, your storage, you choose a network stack, that kind of thing. It looks like a very, very big computer. Um, and the API, the controller itself, is, is kind of what's, it's kind of the file system now, right? So, Kubernetes is also declarative. This was very important because it wasn't really explained to me when I started. You declare a state, and Kubernetes' main purpose is to make that happen. I'll get to that in a second. Um, Kubernetes places containers on things called nodes. A node is a computer, just think of it that way. Right? Just think of a rack, one, one U is a node, for now. Um, it does basic monitoring, logging, and health checking, and enables containers to discover each other. This is important when we said that now you have a bunch of containers. Right? It would suck if you had a whole bunch of containers and they didn't, if your database can't talk to your web app, that would suck. Wouldn't it be nice if they just knew that they were supposed to do that? So it kind of gives you nice things around that. Okay. Here I go on immutability again. So if you look at a traditional operating system and then you run a puppet apply on it, right, you go into this machine, do these five things in order, right? So I log into the container, run app, get update, kill the old server, start a new one, right? The nice thing about immutability is it gives you one single artifact. And when you publish this artifact in your registry, it's there unless you delete it. But let's, for now, let's just say you have those. So when you mess up, you can always arbitrarily roll back to any one of those older images. <clears throat> this is important because you get a lot of awesome stuff for free when you can do this, right? So now, instead of, I'm going to build a server, 10 things need to happen and they all need to succeed. Oops, it couldn't get access to the operating system mirror at that time, so it fails, right? You have to repeat that 13 times, right? But with a container, even if it fails, I just rebuild it again. And once I do it, then I copy that 13 times, and that's one operation. Everyone understand? So instead of monks writing copies of books, we're inventing the printing press. Did everyone get that? When he told me that, I was like, oh, I'm adding that. That's perfect. Um, so that's, that's pretty important. OK, so declarability is pretty easy. Someone explained to me it this way. Something that's imperative, it means you're making statements. Look in your history file. That's Right, I sudo app get update, I sudo app get upgrade, I sudo app install this, I sudo app install that, right? You ever see a machine that someone broke, what's the first thing you do? You look in the history file, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, oh, you're fired, right? <laughs> uh, Castro, you're fired. Um, and if you think about it, when we're using these older mutable systems, right? I need a new web front end. I need a new web front end. I need a new web front end, right? Declarative is make three replicas of the web front end. Does everyone understand that distinction? Okay, sweet. <clears throat> All right, so we got a lot of neat properties because of this. First one is self-healing. So when you make a declaration and you make these in YAML files, and we'll get to the YAML file mess in a minute, um, when something goes wrong, Kubernetes will always try to resolve itself to its desired state. So when Jim comes along and says, huh, who left that server on and turns it off, the Kubernetes scheduler will say, I'm supposed to have three replicas of something, a webhead is missing. Oh, I'll just create a new one, right? Because as far as it's concerned, its view of the world is to make that declarative statement uh, probable. Um, true. true, thank you. And as we said before, because this is a dynamic environment, me personally don't care what the IP address, probably didn't even notice it didn't happen because I chose three replicas and there's a load balancer and it does magical things for me. 
Um, and this kind of decoupling allows for horizontal scale. So usually with these services, you put a load balancer front. So we would have web front end with a load balancer and database with a load balancer, <coughs> right? These have a virtual IP that I can access to, hopefully with DNS, because that's human, human nice. And then all the stuff that's happening underneath, all this churn and upgrading and stuff, happens, and the load balancer is smart enough to make sure that when I'm hitting F5, I'm always getting a page and not a 404. And I'll show you that with a diagram in a minute. Um, so this is really nice, because when you force things like this, you can say, uh-oh, it's Christmas. We need 13 replicas, not three. Right? So all I do is I change replicas 3 to replicas 13, and I hit apply. I do a cube cuddle apply. Cube control, sorry, that's apparently the canonical pronouncing of that word. And then it makes the right thing. Right? So this is why immutability is important, because it's just making new copies of something. It's like a, it's like a photocopy machine and not binding a book. Right? All right, so this is what it looks like. I had a more cool looking graph, but then Joe told me to choose this one because it has that stick figure, miserable person. Um, so there's a master, which is being renamed to control plane to make it more accurate of what it actually is. Runs this thing called etcd. You're going to run these on all your masters. You can do a whole talk on etcd. For the purpose of this, it's just a database that keeps track of things that are going on. Okay? Um, you have the API server, which is very important. Um, and then the control manager and the scheduler. One thing I learned about these distributed systems is you want to be as explicit as possible. <coughs> okay, I'll give you an example. Someone said, hey, I tried Kubernetes, but um, we had this weird, weird behavior where when a node got busy, the kernel just started killing, killing things. I was like, well, yes. That's what the <laughs> Linux kernel does. If the Linux kernel is running out of memory, someone's going to die tonight. Right? So some <laughs> process on the machine is going to die. So um, Kelsey Hightower has a great talk on this. Um, he calls it, you can't play Tetris unless you know the size of the block. Right? Because all you're doing is taking Tetris blocks and putting them on nodes. But we'll get to that in a second. So what he was doing is just say, hey, here's my app, run it. Right? The scheduler makes decisions on where to put stuff based on the information that it knows. So something I learned about being explicit is, when you are defining your application and you're telling it to use this container, you're going to tell it this container or pod will use this amount of RAM and this amount of CPU. Right? That allows the scheduler to make smart decisions on where to put stuff. Because what it's doing is, depending on how busy you are, it's basically throwing stuff anywhere and it's killing things and it's doing all this stuff. Right? If Jim's application takes two gigs and yours takes three gigs, if I only have two gigs free on a node, I know to give you an error right away. We can just add that up, right? So one thing I've noticed is a lot of the examples aren't explicit, right? So it ends up the more information the scheduler has, the smarter decision it, it can make as far as putting workload somewhere. Um, and I have a link to Kelsey's talk at the end, which is way better than this one. Um, so you have the master control plane. Uh, these have to be an odd number, right? I think because of the etcd quorum thing. All right, so let's just assume you either start with one, three, or five. Um, and then nodes are the rest of the cluster, right? They used to be called minions back in the day, but mm. now they're called nodes. They run a thing called a kubelet, which kind of takes mm. commands from the controller, and then Docker <coughs> itself, which is actually the runtime. This part can be swapped in and out with other things, like the Red Hat people have a thing called cryo, which goes in there. Don't worry about that for now. Just just, there's a thing that runs containers here, mm -hmm. right? That's the technical term. Um, so as many nodes, you can have as many nodes as you want, right? And as you're throwing, as you're deploying applications into the cluster, the scheduler will put them someplace. And each of these things are called pods, which I'll get to in a minute, and they have labels, and you could do really neat things like this application needs a certain level of CPU, so it might land on a certain node, right? This uh, this workload might need really fast disks, right? So I labeled the node, the uh, the nodes with fast disks as MVME one two three four five or whatever it is. So you have some, you have a lot of control on where things land. But generally speaking, when talking about it conceptually, is then you throw things at the 
at the master and then make sure that stuff is landing everywhere. Everyone still with me? Awesome. <clears throat> All right. So for the purpose of this talk, just think of a node as a physical server or instance, right? It's like the uh, 4x extra large on Amazon or like one, you know, one physical server. Um, inside of each node, pods run. So a pod is a container or a group of containers. Don't confuse yourself like I overly confuse myself. Just for now, for simple applications, just assume that a pod is a container for now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to swear on the little Bible there. Um, but in, in, in a lot of general cases, a pod only runs one container, and that's fine. Pod is the simplest object in Kubernetes. Like, so even if you're only running uh, one container, it's like kind of a pod, okay? So a pod, that comes from, this is all nautical lingo, so a pod is like a group of whales. Um, so each pod has an application container, probably Docker, uh, storage resources, a unique network IP, because not all distributed systems have this. Um, each pod will get a unique IP that's dynamically assigned to it, okay? This is important because when that pod dies, and a pod launches somewhere else, it's probably going to get a different IP address, right? Yes, of course it is, right? Um, anything in a pod can talk inside a pod, right? But in order to talk to something else, another pod, it needs um, it needs a agreed, oh, what's the best way to generic, like an agreed way to talk to it. Most commonly, a port, right? So if the pod holding the web front ends needs to talk to the MySQL database. You're doing 3306, what's the default MySQL port? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, I got that one right. Mm -hmm. Take that, Bash guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so out of these pods, you define these things called services. And these are done in the YAML file. Um, so it defines a set of pods as a service. Like people call these like web front ends. Um, or whatever. <coughs> but the pods themselves, like I said, they'll get a unique IP every time they're killed or started or whatever, right? And it's the service. You're defining a service here because it makes you, it's interesting that it makes the stable IP or DNS name be one level up so that the churn can happen down here in the pods, right? I mean, pods are dying and living all the time. If you do an upgrade, you're killing a bunch of pods. Right? But it's the service you care about, right? Just like, remember when we used to care about host, remember we're so proud of our Unix uptimes or whatever, and then it's like, no, it's a service that's important, right? Um, and then pods are managed by these things called controllers. Uh, deployment, a stateful set, daemon set. Don't think about stateful set or daemon sets now. That's like, it's like algebra, we're only doing basic arithmetic right now. Um, you'll know when you need a stateful set. Remember when I said those applications that flip out if they can't track state? Stateful set is a response to that to give a net. That we're not going to have the entire world rewrite their applications, right? So like this gives them a place to go. However advanced topic, um, same with daemon set for now. Um, so I'm going to do at a deployment, which is actually two levels above a service. There's this thing called replication controller or replica sets that's in between those. All these are separated on purpose. A pod has no idea what a replica set is, and a replica set has no idea what a service is. Right? The pod lives in its own thing. It's managed by something else, and as far as it knows, it doesn't know any better. Um, so replication is wait, replica sets the old one, replication controller is a new one, right? Sorry, stuff's changing like every three months. Um, these basically manage sets of pods, right? That is called a replica. Remember earlier when we said replica equals three? That's what the replication controller is making sure. So if there isn't three, it knows how to do that. Now deployments, I think you kind of, if you're looking at like, a la oh, I, I want to play with Elasticsearch, you're Googling for a deployment because it has all this other stuff underneath that, remember at math where she made you like learn everything and then at the end she taught you the trick? That's the trick. Um, though you still should know all the other stuff first. So this is what a deployment looks like, right? Hey, 
this kind of looks very similar <coughs> to that Docker Compose thing, right? Um, so hey, name, we're going to call this Nginx Deployment. Uh, it has three replicas. We have um, a selector with the labels. The app, we're just going to call it Nginx. Everything, objects in Kubernetes, you want to put labels to, because that's what translates all of this stuff to humans, right? So instead of calling something Nginx 17456, you call it web front ends prod or whatever. Um, and then here, this looks very similar too, right? We want to use a container named Nginx with this exact, we're going to name it Nginx, but it's going to use this exact image and then the ports. Looks very similar, right? You can kind of work through this and figure out what it is. So there's a lot of examples of deployments in Kubernetes. So that's what you want to Google for. Um, so what you do is you grab this YAML file, you like wget it from GitHub because YOLO, um, and then you run this and then it spawns it in your cluster. This is when you will understand the power of Kubernetes because you will be like, awesome, I've got a three node thing running and all I did was grab a piece of YAML that I barely understand and shoved it somewhere, right? It's pretty awesome. So we created a pod named app nginx, one container named nginx using the image nginx 1.7.9 uh, from the Docker Hub, which is kind of implied in this case, and then we're going to open port 80, right? So your container would look like that. You would shove your thing in there, and that's, that's how you serve something. So if we want to do an update, we would say, hey, let's set the image to this version, right? And then we'll tell us, okay. And then we would do something really neat, like a rolling upgrade, um, and it would just roll that out, right? Now, a lot of people have done this before, but you had to make it by hand, and that really sucked, right? So things like canary deployments or red-green, have you guys heard of that? Or as Netflix likes to call them, red and black. Um, you have all the primitives to create these kind of deployments. So a red-green would be, okay, Rick's delivered a new app. I have this version of the app running, version 2.0. I've worked with Rick, so I know there were bugs the night before, so he quickly in the morning busted out a 2.01. So what am I going to do? I'm going to roll out 2.01. It's going to spin up new pods with containers in them. With 2.01, they're going to pull his fresh, his fresh app, and then over time these will get killed, and then stuff just kicks over. So it's not telling you how to do a rollout, whether a canary is a good idea, or whether you should use feature flags or not, or whether red green's even for you, or if you just want to do an upgrade in place, right? It's giving people the primitives to do this, and I'll get this in a minute. Um, so this is what an upgrade looks like. So I literally just showed you two Kubernetes objects, and there are a lot of them, and you can do lots of neat things. I haven't gotten into networking, I haven't gotten into storage, because each of these little YAML files that you have will say, I need this amount of storage from this thing. Some are simple, right? Like if you have a fancy NAS or SAN at work and it has a native Kubernetes driver, you just say, I need 32 gigs of something, right? And then, oh, the app gets that, right? Or if you're in a cloud, it's a Google Cloud, I need a disk. If it out. Bare metal, it's a little tough. Like I, I thought I could do hyper-convert storage, I was thinking, and like make every node also be storage, and that was, that was terrible, but you can you can make that mistake on your own. Um, but there are tons and tons of Kubernetes objects. These these are just two of them. So there are controllers, there are operators, custom resource definitions. Again, you can go on and on. I just wanted to give you a taste here <coughs> so far. And man, this really sounds complicated. Like yes, yes. Um, it kind of is, but it also lets people build cool stuff. So, what if <coughs> instead, so this is one of my favorite things. What, what are people deploying, Elasticsearch? Is that a good one? What? Anything? Oh. Give me an example. GitLab. GitLab, that's a good one. What? Um. <laughs> Absolutely is a GitLab chart somewhere. Hmm. All right. Next time, pick it up ahead of time. Okay. Right, let's do elastic search. Let's do this one. Right. So here's an example of something called Helm. It is a 
higher level project, so I've likened it to ACT for Kubernetes, that will take all the stuff that I talked about, kind of wrap it up in a thing they call a chart, and you just run this command on your cluster, and blam, there's your thing. Now, would it be cool if you had an internal version of this at work that had trusted versions that your security people have vetted and are all nice and maintained? This is, I'm kind of showing you this as far as the, uh, the kind of um, things that Kubernetes allows you to build, right? Um, so this is just an example of something. Uh, this is made by the Bednavi folks. They're like pretty smart. You should definitely check out their stuff. Um, so instead of wrestling with all that YAML, this is all kind of like what I had to do. One of the biggest concerns or criticisms people have about Kubernetes is there's a lot of YAML by the time you're done, right? Like I didn't even, I didn't even show you all some serious, serious like Kubernetes. Uh, let's just randomly go on the internet. Like each of these. <coughs> <coughs> People hate this, right? Um, but it is nice to declare stuff. And it is also really nice to be able to reuse someone's stuff and then adapt it to yourself. This is an area where a lot of people are making, there's a lot of innovation here, right? You have Helm, Heptio, we're working on this thing called Case on it that's kind of trying to solve this problem. Um, when I hang out with Joe and we have beers, he was like, oh, originally we thought, hey, we could put all of the thing in a YAML file. And the next thing you know, it's two years later, and people have to deal with this. So this is something people definitely do not like about Kubernetes, um, as you can see here. Lots of awesome stuff going on, but... Could, could have been worse. Could have been XML. Yeah, exactly. I was like, hey, could have been XML. Um, so the nice thing about Kubernetes is this, this is just one, one solution, right? It's, it's opinionated about certain things, but purposely not opinionated. If you sign up for GKE, AKS, EKS, they all have like their cool little thing that they built on top that makes this a lot easier for everybody. Um, but let's ignore the operational complexities for a minute because this is complicated. Um, so a lot of people see this. This is a famous image associated with Kubernetes. And the tagline is, I just deployed my blog on Kubernetes. And if you can't see, that's two pieces of wood <coughs> on a tractor trailer. Um, and in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, that's true. Um, like I said, if, if, if you're thinking you're going to set up your personal website on Kubernetes, probably overkill. Um, uh, but I do have a quick word. Usually when people are complaining about Kubernetes or systems like this, they like to throw out, we're not Google or Facebook or Netflix or Amazon or stuff like that. And I usually like to reply with, no one's saying that you have to run your stuff exactly like Google, right? But all of these things have certain properties that are really nice, right? Like Netflix's ops is different from Google's, right? Like if you read their blog posts and stuff, they do stuff different, right? So yes, running your personal blog on Kubernetes is overkill. However, if your company's whole entire existence is serving and reselling a bunch of WordPress blogs to people, that's where Kubernetes comes in. Right? And even though you might not need some of these technologies right away where you work, you want the properties that these tools provide. Self-healing is nice. It's just like, like I had like a test cluster and I was in Texas and they like, they cut the power to my house to only part of my rack die but not the other one and you know, I like won the, the, the lottery and one pod was still running. It's just nice, man. Like, then I come home, I turn it back on and then everything just came up because of course it does. Those are nice properties, right? Yeah, I'm overkilling myself by running this at home, but there are really there there are times. And if you go on Q, um, search for this, write write this on the things to search for is HBO's keynote during KubeCon uh, in December, right? Who likes Game of Thrones? Everybody, of course, right? You go on HBO now, first few years, Game of Thrones comes on, the whole thing falls over, right? Like. When Sling TV launched, every time The Walking Dead came on, the whole service fell, fell over. Even if you weren't watching Walking Dead, I was like, how? Whatever, right? So in the Kubernetes keynote, they actually show the traffic spikes on what a Game of Thrones episode <coughs> looks like over time. And they talked about how they took their old system and then they kind of migrated to this new way of thinking. 
and it allows it allows you to enjoy Game of Thrones now. So I think a lot of companies are now starting to realize, especially with that last one, um, you might end up competing with a lot of these companies eventually, right? Um, or not, or your competitor might use technologies like this, right? So the ability for people to be agile and stuff is like becoming important. Ops is becoming like a competitive advantage, right? Like I could not wait for YouTube TV to launch in my area because I knew that Google knew how to run scale and it wouldn't fall over like PlayStation View does because they're off. A gateway goes down. It's always off too. I don't know. I don't know why that is, but. Um, but yeah, these are the scale problems we're having. And back, back in the day, you had to work at Google or Facebook or Netflix or Amazon to figure this stuff out, right? Now the tools are available to us, and I think that, that that's really nice. And I think Rick has something. I'll have to say that. The example I love for this is when, everyone remember when uh, the Amazon <coughs> US East region went down? How many companies, like startup -y companies, people you think with like big companies were non-functional offline because they were in that region? And what I find hilarious is people are like, ooh, I'm in the cloud. It, the cloud was like, you know, you basically were given keys to data centers all over the world, but you just kept doing what you used to do. I would go into the little web UI and start an instance and SSH to it and run my make scripts and install my stuff, and you weren't treating it like a disposable, you know, geo-distributed. You had all the tools to build this resilient, fault-resistant, you know, uh, uh, platform that was never available to you at a cost like this before in the past. But people just, they kept taking the new toy and running things the way they used to do it, and the same thing, and it didn't improve, it didn't make any better, because when that region went down, everything went down. But then when they went, oh wait, you mean I can actually easily and cheaply run this stuff in two different regions, and load balance, and, and I have all these tools available to me, I can actually handle these failures better by, by using better practices. And I think this gets into a lot of that by, by having your things able to be killed off, by distributing them across different nodes, by you know going through all this stuff. Yes, you can't just do what you used to do and, and gain the benefits, but if you think, if it teaches you and gives you the rails to think better, you get a lot of these benefits yeah. by adopting the best practices. Continuous rollouts are the big one for Kubernetes, right? Yes. Well, I don't, I don't, need, I don't need to de deploy 10 times a day. Well, you may not, but you can, and if you follow these examples, maybe you can start to deploy every day instead of, well, all right, everyone, releases in two months. How are we gonna get the QA testers in here and start getting all of the, you know, yeah. uh, all that tied in for our two-month release? It's like, once you're doing it every day, it just becomes part of the problem. I also thought it was really awesome that the status page, whether to tell you whether US East 1 was up or down, was hosted only in US East 1. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh, they make mistakes also, yay. It was then moved to S3, and it was hosted only in S3, and then there was an S3 outage across yeah. the world that also brought down the status quo. Yeah. That's, we live in interesting <coughs> times. Um, so this is complicated. I'm not going to lie to you. So um, ideally, your developers don't need to care. right? So one thing we like to do um, is to set someone up with a dev workflow where it's like, you're gonna branch, you're gonna follow these instructions, and then I just want you to get push. I don't want you to worry about any of this, right? And then we build pipelines and things like that. So I started Googling, I was like, aha, awesome CI, CD, Kubernetes pipeline. I found some awesome stuff, <laughs> awesomely terrible stuff. Um, but I, I found, I, I just grabbed random ones. So this is a GitOps pipeline, the WeaveWorks guys like this one. This is a good one that like uh, people like. Um, right around here is when we get in a lot of trouble, like for a lot of organizations, because Kubernetes is like one part of this, right? Um, all this stuff, you're probably using Git. You may or may not be using containers, but um, here's another one, right? I don't know why Golang is on there. Why do you care what language is written? Whatever. Um, so this kind of talks, talks about how you're organizing things so that you can do upgrades easier and things like that. Um, there's yet another one, um, right? I don't recommend mixing OpenStack or Kubernetes in any of this at all. That, that might be controversial in some circles, but I'm sticking to it. Um, and then, of course, Oracle's going to try to sell you something. Um, but, yeah, this kind of tells you, right? You're going to get, and, that, and then that's going to build a container. It's going to push it to that registry I talked to you about. It's going to pass some tests. Here's a registry, 
private registry, so that's probably expensive, and then eventually it gets deployed into Kubernetes, right? So usually people, people like us, um, I care about giving people this experience here to be really good for your developers, and then your ops people here um, make this experience really good. And then if you're DevOps, you get to worry about all of that. DevOps, another, another talk. You should get Chris Short to come in. He does, he does DevOps talks. That's a good one. Um, so a lot of these workflows are org specific. Um, they're kind of a reflection of how you do deployments. One of the biggest questions we get is, what CI CD tool should I be using with Kubernetes? And the answer is, which one do you like? Like, you can just use Jenkins. You can use Circle. There's a whole bunch of stuff that each one can have a separate talk on how to do it. Um, so containers and Kubernetes are just part of this. I feel that I'll, containers and Kubernetes are getting a lot of the uh, attention right now, but it's only part part of the uh, uh, part of the puzzle. Bridget has a great talk uh, paper that she just wrote that she's done as a <coughs> talk before called "Containers Will Not Fix a Broken Culture," or is um, that's just worth a read. Go Google for that. Um, and for a lot of people, running your infrastructure like this is totally different than traditional IT, right? Like, I talked to some people and they're like, well, how do you do stuff? I developed stuff on my laptop and then I fill out a form for a virtual machine and then in two days someone gets back to me, right? If you have that and you want to use Kubernetes, you will fail hard, right? So the idea there is, is you want things to be dynamic and give your developers a place where they can play, but also not accidentally, you know, open the keys to the castle and then you're on hacker news for the wrong reasons. Um, this one, I, this might be hard to hear for some people, depending. Um, sometimes I tell people, you're not ready for Kubernetes. I have a friend, I don't want to embarrass him, his name is Trevor. <laughs> and he, he, he's telling me all his problems and stuff, and he was like, I was like, man, you're not even close you got other stuff to deal with right now. That's okay, right? This stuff is brand, I think a lot of times people forget, this stuff is like new, new stuff. We put out a release every three months. Three months, that's twice as fast as like your Linux distro, right? There is churn in there that's like pretty churny, right? Even the hosted Google stuff doesn't come out with the latest version right away. Um, so you should learn these things, but don't feel like, oh no, like, if I don't get this, I'm, like, in deep trouble, right? Um, so, so why is this popular, then, if this is so complicated? So people like the API, right? It's a lot like Linux, where by itself it's just a thing, right? So think of Linux this way. Linux by kernel is kind of useless. You put a GNU user space on it, you got a full operating system. That's sweet, right? That's kind of how most people run Linux, right? However, I can take that same kernel put an Android user space on it, this is nothing like my desktop Linux, right? It's still using the same kernel, different user space, right? So like the kernel, it does provide some things, but it also gives people the flexibility to kind of build stuff on top. Um, and that's where the interesting things are going to happen. If you go to the CNCF website, and I'm almost done because I want people to ask questions. I want, I want you to ask that one question you had about app. Like all this other interesting stuff, is just now getting built, right? And Kubernetes is like kind of the thing that they deploy on. Um, and the community. So I, this is a whole different talk at itself. Uh, since the early days, uh, people have, they really, really made a strong effort to make the community welcoming, opening, um, like the developer experience. They totally nailed that. Um, we are now running into problems of scale, right? I don't run into a lot of open source projects that it's like, I need to solve 900 open pull requests. It's not like we're not closing them either. We're closing them all the time, right? But like, we're reaching levels of scale that right now, oh, the only other thing that's busier than this is the Linux kernel right now. I can say that with great confidence. Um, so we are running into scaling issues. Um, this is one of my favorite tutorials. And I'm glad someone mentioned the other one. Um, the Red Hat folks did this, Kubernetes by example. Remember I only showed you two Kubernetes objects? This basically will walk you through an entire thing. This thing is awesome, I love it. Um, so if you're gonna be 
doing this kind of stuff, if someone says, hey, we're going to do Kubernetes, tell people about this. This is, this is the good one. This is like Vim Tutor. I don't know if you guys know. That's how I learned Vim. Um, this one, when you ask people, hey, how should I learn Kubernetes? Uh, people always point to Kubernetes the hard way. Kubernetes the hard way is a lot like compiling your Linux kernel. Do it once. <coughs> like, do it once so you understand the concepts, and then never touch it again. Right? It's like, I'm proud that I forgot how to compile a Linux kernel. Uh, most people don't need this, but it's also an excellent, excellent learning tool. Um, this one, uh, the YouTube URL is too long. It's called Kubernetes for Sysadmins. It's from Kelsey Hightower, who is now at Google, formerly of CoreOS. He gave this talk during PuppetConf. So it was to an audience of system and Linux people already. Right? So that's where he kind of talked about the Tetris blocks, and he actually shows live YAML <coughs> and, them and things like that. Um, this is, I still see this, this talk is a few years old, I still go back and watch it um, every, every once in a while. Um, and thanks, and I wanted to, this is, I have a kid now, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, so awesome. Some days I'm like, please don't go into technology. So I wanted to leave some time at the end, what do you got, 10 minutes? 10, 15 minutes? Uh, for people to ask Ralph questions or more technical questions. Yeah. So, um, how difficult would it be for me to install this on something? I mean, I'm looking at the docs out here, and it's like, yeah. you know, do a, you know, do a command to grab the thing and then set up your permissions and copy it into your directory, and yep. now you have something on it, right? Yep. So one thing I did is I took the docs, and I kind of created this cheat sheet for myself. So I did this last year more often than this time. I was like, I'm going to rebuild a cluster once a week. Um, so this is the cube admin documentation distilled in a way that I could just copy and paste without having to read all the, all the other stuff. This is also available on the official docs. In fact, I linked to it, and I linked to another tutorial there. Um, so I just take, take a normal Ubuntu system there on top, make sure I have unattended upgrades on. Always want to be on a new kernel when it comes to containers. Um, that's like a pro tip there. Um, and then I prep each node for Kubernetes. Like the, um, so I add the repository for Kubernetes. This installs Docker, which is a version of Docker that's tested to work, and then the other bits. And then I recommend for, for a while, uh, again, just running it on one machine. It will act like a bunch of machines. And then when it gets busy, just add other nodes later. That's, that's one thing that's really nice. You don't need multiple machines to replicate a cluster. Now that machine, you type kubeadmin in it, then you follow the instructions, it will tell you stuff. Um, and then it will spit out a config. This config you're going to copy to your laptop or any machine that you want to administer the cluster. So if there's a team of you and you're sharing one machine, this is the file you want to give everyone a copy of so that they can mess it up. Um, then you install networking. I generally recommend Weave for beginners. Like If you have network administrator in your job title, you're probably going to pick Calico, but from like if you're learning this stuff, you just want the things to get IP address, I think Weave works is fine. So I just do that as a nice, easy, rememberable installer. Um, and then by default, those master nodes I talk about usually won't get workload scheduled on them because their job is to manage the cluster. So with this command, we basically say, eh, put workloads on the master, it's fine, we just have one. Um, and then on other machines, it will give you a token. And then on other machines, you basically say, join with this token and then the IP address <coughs> port of the master node. And then they will, this is my home lab here. So af after a few minutes, you type kubectl, show me the nodes. These are the nodes. That's their host name, the status. Hyperion here, you can see, is in the middle of being installed because it's only 16 seconds old. It tells you the version. That's kind of neat. Um, and then you type things like cluster info. <coughs> so that Kubernetes, by example, kind of walks you through this. Um, and then you're ready to go. And then I, I tossed how to copy the config to your local laptop and stuff like that. Um, and then the very first application you will deploy is the Kubernetes dashboard. Oh, obviously that's not going to work. Um, which is like a little GUI, like when you see pictures of Kubernetes dashboard. This is kind of like the generic picture you see. Please don't show up. Okay, good. Um, so this kind of gives you like the nice UI for the, for the cluster and stuff. This is what people put on the home page. This is like where your manager's like, I want this. Right? And you're like, you don't know what that means, dude. 
but that's okay. Um, so yeah, the very first app you deploy is the is the dashboard onto itself because it kind of comes kind of comes empty. Um, so I, I actually installed this and I had it on on my house. Then I realized that I could do all the learning without using all three nodes. So I, I just right, right now what I'm doing is I have an Intel NUC. It's the next unit of computing. It's like a great little machine. Um, and then I just follow those steps on there. And then I have one node, right? And then I treat it like a cluster, even though it's one physical node. But I can add other nodes to it as I see fit. So I like to add, when I'm messing around in my little home lab, I always add one that's a laptop on a wireless link, because I wanted to see what would happen, right, if you're doing like replicas, right? And then you're like, oh, that image is big, right? And then it's neat because when people come over, this is what I do on the weekends. When people come over and I'm showing them the Kubernetes, like they close the laptop, right? And that kind of simulates a machine going down somewhere, right? And then you sit there and you watch, watch the little dashboard, and you watch it figure out, oh no, stuff is missing, and then it fires it off somewhere else and stuff. So that's that's kind of neat. And then I just have them sit there hitting F5 on the example web app, right? And it's not missing a beat, and it kind of helps understand the uh, the concepts a little bit better. Thanks. Yeah, cube admin, I think, is the way to go for you. That's what I would recommend. Yep. What's the minimum hardware you need for a node? Uh, minimum hardware you need for a node. Do, do we actually say that? No, I, I, have, I have a terrible home cluster of like two yeah. or two duos. Yeah, so like people are doing. Um, on, on a node, you've got the, the whatever platform you're running on, Docker or whatnot, and a little agent thing, right? So it's whatever workloads you're going to run on it. That's going to be infinitely more powerful than whatever okay. the, the, yeah. the basics are that you need. So. A lot of people like to do Raspberry Pis. Mm -hmm. My problem <laughs> is, this is so cool. I'm like, I'm going to do this, right? By the time you buy all those, you're reaching x86 prices. Anyway. <laughs> and like, you have to buy a switch and all that. And like that. That's cool. And then I also realized that if you use something like Minikube on your laptop and stuff will be, you know, or on your Mac, just fire up Docker for Kubernetes or whatever, it will be infinitely more powerful than that. Uh, plus, there's this weird thing where you're like, oh, Get these Docker containers and run it on here, and then it's like, oh no, these don't work on ARM. And then you rebuild, you find yourself at two in the morning rebuilding Docker containers for ARM, and you're like, why am I doing this? This is nuts. Um, so let's look at uh, the Raspberry Pi cluster and list a uh, total build price of 300 bucks. How many? How many nodes? Like a four With the switch and the cables and all that stuff? Yeah, list I don't know, because my NUC was 350 bucks. It was like an i3, but like a modern i3 is not that yeah. bad. I mean, yeah, of course I want more cores, but um, oh feels like modern Garner hardware is like. Yeah, so this is with four Raspberry Pi 3s. Yeah. You're not, is that x86? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, this is a thing that I like. The things are awesome. I've got a yeah. lab of eight of them that I yeah. use for stuff. But it's New so ones have Optane and everything? It's sweet. You, you, kind of, you, you, go, you go, man, I forgot that the cloud's actually slow because real hardware, even on Nook, is so much faster than any VM you get on a public cloud. 376, I love that. This one, an i5, too. Nice. Oh, no, hard drive, that's why it's cheap. Yeah. New ones will come with NVMe drives and everything. You know, it's, like, it's not even just an SSD, it's like a really fast SSD. There's another one called Shuttle Shuttlebox. I think so, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> the shuttles because it has 64 gigs. Yeah, exactly. So it comes with like more stuff, yeah. Nice. yeah. One thing I like also, I found out that the University of Michigan, and I think MSU does this, is they have a property disposition office because universities have to get rid of hardware every three years, whether it's good or not. Mm -hmm. So I'm picking up like Dell Double Z on rack mounts with 72 gigs of RAM for like 300 bucks. Matex. Matex? Yeah, no, um, and then you get your power bill, and you're like, why am yeah, I doing yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you tell me, yeah, the yeah. Intel NUC is a way to go. N-A-T-E-X. -E they, um, oh, my name's Luther, by the way. The only reason I know this is because I'm in, uh, uh, I'm in, like, an information assurance program. So I, I got to run, like, a lot of virtual labs a lot of times. So but one of my people in my class found this, and it's really cool because it's the same thing that MSU does. But they sell the kits. I mean, so they, they have some really amazing stuff on here. Like, for me, it's all about RAM. So they have kits on here, like 128 gigs of RAM for 800 bucks. You know, like two Intel Xenon Core processors, 
you can buy the board and then if you have a case you just want to keep it whatever, 800 bucks you have all that processing power. Because new is expensive. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. They use, it's all refurbished. So they right. use it's all refurbished Schirmer hardware. Slap a, an SSD on there, I mean. Yeah, yeah. it, it kind of reminds me of like. 2002 you got a fully functional server. Like if you ever go to the Computer History Museum in Mount View, if you ever go out there, it's awesome. They have one of the original racks from Google, back when they were like pe like pizza boxes, like cardboard, mm -hmm. and they would assemble the computers and just shove it into a rack, and it would sag in the middle and everything. <laughs> they didn't care because the software, if something died, they didn't care. They just replaced it, right? Um, so George, how cheap is this to try out like a GKE or something though? Right? Like we're talking hardware, because we all love hardware. Yeah, so GK, I think so GKE has, has a free. Has a free. Right, the nice thing is you can play has a free it in tier cloud, pretty darn cheap. Much, I mean, even cheaper than Raspberry Pis. Yeah. Uh, if any of you know, know uh, Tony Bemis, one of the members here, he sell, resells old hardware that's refurbished. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's look at the instance price. Yeah. Power bills. Yeah. 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 So I was like, oh, I have these racks. I'm gonna fold proteins over Christmas break, and I got like eight hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have your attention. The time is now 8.30, and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 p.m. Uh, Please be advised that the library's internet connection will begin to shut down no. approximately 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. Question about scaling. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, as an example, you had a, a configuration that had three nodes, if I remember correctly. Three replicas. Three replicas. Right. Okay. Does a replica necessarily correspond to a node? So you will never, you, you, the same pod won't run on the same node, right? <clears throat> right, Ralph? Not necessarily. You can okay. make it so they'll tolerate each other. <laughs> right. You can do it with a whole bunch of ways that you can choose how you want things to run. So you can make it so that they never run on the same machine, or you can have ones that run on the same machine. Generally, your best so, practice is to spread them out across machines for for fault hand, 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 right, handling failure, right? Right. So I'm just wondering. So I'm wondering if that is that number fixed, or can you can you make it dynamic? For example, if I have an application that uses a certain chunk of, of RAM, sure, and I want to say, okay, if this machine is going up, go ahead and spin up another node. Yes. But more. Yep. In fact, more. there are a lot of tools. I just read one today that will say, hey, Amazon, add more nodes with this cloud formation template, you know. Um, and because it's API driven, your app can always, uh, Kelsey's latest talks kind of talks about how application developers can leverage the Kubernetes API directly. Right now this is operation stuff with YAML, right? But, you know, his idea was like, think about it if your application was smart enough to know it needed nodes, right? And then you're like, that sounds great, and they're like, eh. then your first question is like, am I painting myself in a corner? I don't know, but like I said, this is still a new, I don't think we're quite to the point yet where an application is dynamically figuring out what it needs. What people are doing though is they're using a tool like Prometheus that provides metrics on their app and said, aha, Jim told me he needed two gigs, but I noticed that his app only uses one gig. So dynamically shrink the amount of RAM that you need, right, so I can fit more stuff on a server, right? Because ideally, it's sort of like VMs when they say fit more stuff onto nodes so you're not wasting time on electricity. Right. Yes, sir. So, what about the person, a developer, mm -hmm. who wants to use Kubernetes or just Docker, really, mm -hmm. um, to try out a bunch of apps quickly and plug yep. them together? Is that feasible on a laptop? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I can. Mm -hmm. uh, there are whole developer tools where, like, you play with their Dark tool. Docker like, you don't get command line tool or whatnot. They'll just ship you a Docker container instead of dealing with, you know, shipping you a binary to to run or whatnot, like or a PPA to go add and install the thing. And people are, are using it for all kinds of really small stuff. Wow, I can't believe that I actually found something. What about the tools for setting that up from the developer's perspective? Yeah, so to just run somebody else's already built container, you just need the basic Docker runtime. Yep, and a lot of them will have. So, so you got that, right? So now you've got five of them. You want to string them together. Oh, is as that, far as so this this is a good question. So when you're running on your laptop, 
Docker, right? And you type Docker run, WordPress, Docker run, Kubernetes, they'll be able to talk to each other. You specify chunks of the files that right. are Yes, right. So either you'll do like localhost colon 80, like it depends on how you set it up. So by default, host mode is not by default, right, in Docker? I'm looking over generally in that direction. <laughs> so you can either tell Docker, use the IP address of this laptop, but then take that port, right? So if I run WordPress on it, port 80 on this laptop will have the same IP address as you're giving the laptop. Or you can run it in bridge NAT mode, which gives all the containers their own NATed IP address, right? Which is a little cleaner if you want to do local development, right? To be fair, I actually think Minikube is a little, I think Kubernetes is actually a little bit easier for that because the same way that you would scale it in a big application with services and pods, is the same way that you can run it on your local machine. Because all you're doing is saying, oh, hey, I have these pods that make up this service. And then from the other stuff that you're trying to string together, who wants the big you one? just Who like needs through. this for work the most? <laughs> Dead serious. Okay. He raised his hand the highest. That it's sounds like a good measure. Me? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you win. Anybody else? A few books? Let's get can you split those between those two back there? And then third guy? Sorry. There you are. All right, thank you, George. Sorry it was so George? short. Like I said, this is <laughs> like we didn't even get we didn't even get we didn't even get anywhere. This is such an iceberg. This is like easily the most complicated thing I've ever been involved with. But like in a lot of ways you kind of feel like like it it's replicating the early days of Linux, right? Where it's like you know, what do you mean it doesn't support SMP, right? Like, I remember when SMP support land and US, remember you could finally use a USB keyboard? So they were like, you're kind of replicating that again where you're like, you know, before stateful sets existed, it was like, well, if you have, if you want to run a database in there, too bad. This is like XCOMF. Yeah. All the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, if you had more time, you would have made a shorter presentation. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> but I'm always in the area. Ralph is definitely in the area. So if you want a more detailed, you know, knee deep on a specific area, um, then we can certainly like help provide that stuff. And if you're close to the Ann Arbor area, there's a meetup group called Orca Structure where we meet once a month and we kind of try to go through this, but like we have the same problem where it's like we can't even get to Istio yet because we're still figuring all this stuff out. And there's just this whole world of new stuff. It's like very, very awesome. Are there slides that you can Yeah, I'll send them to you and you can send them. Um, a lot of the stuff is easily Googleable. Um, if you if you remember one thing tonight, Kelsey Hightower's talks on YouTube. It's pretty much the go-to person. Yeah, he's he's like the master of explaining this stuff in a, in a way that you can learn it, and he gives you practical demos so you understand. Um, so yeah. All right, thank you. That's Christmas. All right. Oh, is this Did you? Yeah, this is theirs. Just delete it. Just delete it. Just delete it. Yeah.